Everything versus everything. Fight! fight, fight, fight. everyone and welcome to everything versus everything episode 11 woo Woo-hoo. still going didn't stop at episode 10 like i thought we might because it's very hard <laughs> it's very hard to get past a milestone like that but we managed it i'm joined today by nobody at all in in this room at least it's our first all internet episode Ooh, fancy beep, beep, not beep, to beep. show you behind the curtain or anything but um i'm joined by two people through the magic of technology and those people are starting with the blonde guy with glasses Go. Is, <laughs> is that me? <laughs> I, I, arguably, it could be either of us, but you're more blonde than I, so please go forth. As far as I understood, it was Ginger. Um, hello, it's Mark, live from Glasgow. I was thought of you as blonde. Well, that's very kind. Do you not uh, think of me as blonde? That, I, yeah, I think both of you as blonde, yeah. You didn't know me early enough in my life to think, ever think of me as Ginger, that's the problem. Yeah, mine's think, gone kind of brownie recently. I don't think Ginger is a problem. I'm not suggesting it is, but. No. Yeah, anyway, sorry, did you actually say you were? I made that very confusing I, for everyone. I thought I had. We could do it again mm. if you want. <laughs> I think you probably did. You're Mark, though. Right? Hello, I'm Mark. How Yay. are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, excellent. And how's the other guy? Oh, actually, we should probably ask who he is rather than how he is. No, how Hello. are you, other guy? Oh, I'm good, yeah. Good. Excited to be taking part in my first episode. And what's your name? My name is Gavin. Yay! Yeah, you, got Hello. It. you should have been on it a long time ago. You've been talked about on this podcast more than anyone else. You're like the oh, off-stage character that we've been <laughs> setting up for so long. Every time so, there's anything controversial, it's, oh, Gavin isn't going to like this. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's I mean, certain worrying. things weren't controversial, but they're controversial to me. Well, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we'll see how that compass gets on. I oh, I know. Might, I know. might not be retaining its esteemed position up near the top I for much longer. I highly doubt it. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, we should probably just get into the bulk of the show, and that begins with the section that I call Bring a Thing! <laughs> Woo! Do, In Bring do, a Thing... Do, do. Oh, go on, sorry. Sorry, I was doing the theme. Go oh, on. Cool. In Bring a Thing, we bring a thing each, and we add it to our list of things, and we try and rank it according to what is better or worse. I uh, explain that in a very bad way, but you'll get the idea when we start. Hmm, who's going to go first this time? I think it should be... Gavin. Okay, I recently was thinking a bit about the the recent general election. Oh God! And, uh, I oh. I wanted to bring. No, 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 no. This is a this is a very. I like this thing. I think I think most people do, but it's uh, it's it's a German thing. It's called Schadenfreude. <laughs> Excellent. So I am bringing Schadenfreude to the table. The okay. concept, or or the word itself, or the the concept of Schadenfreude. The, Excellent. The, the, the happiness at the misfortune of others. Okay, do you want to explain a little bit about what is well, so good about it, or what? Maybe you don't yeah, think it's good. I mean, maybe you think it's bad. It's it's like karma in its own way. I mean, particularly I'm thinking about Theresa May and and her thinking that she has the upper hand, and then what happens happens, and then uh, you end up with this beautiful situation where she's made everything worse for herself. So it's just a great sense of schadenfreude. Now, it's not always a great thing. There's definitely times, you know, you could be the subject of someone laughing at your misfortune. That's not very nice. Yeah. However, I- I'm looking at it from the point of view that I'm laughing at the misfortune of other people when they deserve it. But yeah, there are people who laugh at the misfortune of people who don't deserve it. So it's not always good. But mm. schadenfreude, when you're experiencing it, you're guiding it by your own morals. So in that sense... It's always a good thing to you when you're experiencing schadenfreude. Yeah, but doesn't it make you feel guilty sometimes? Don't you sometimes feel conflicted about it? Sometimes. There are those in the middle where you're like, oh, I shouldn't laugh, I feel bad, but I'm laughing. 
But surely, I, that, I, sorry, Gavin. Surely, there's there's another German word for feeling guilty about feeling Schadenfreude, though. <laughs> Probably. Mm. And then there's a, a word for laughing at someone else who's feeling guilty because they're feeling Schadenfreude. Yeah. Yeah. It's like meta Schadenfreude. Where does it end? No, oh, it doesn't. Schadenfreude Until the next all election. The way down. <laughs> Next week, as we record this. No. (laughs) Probably. We're going to have to do another politics special fairly soon, I think. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I get get your point. It can be a good feeling, but I think it's one of those feelings that is like, for some reason... No, no, I don't want to say that. The first feeling that popped into my head that was similar was the feeling of peeing yourself. Because... (laughs) Sorry? (laughs) Because... Do go on. you, You get a sort of warm feeling and it's sort of weirdly comfortable but you also know that it's something you shouldn't really have done <laughs> i see i see like so yeah. i don't think it's I, I wouldn't maybe i'm just sort of a oversensitive person but i ha- I do feel schadenfreude sometimes but i also feel guilty for feeling it so it's not a purely positive feeling for me at least it's sort of a tainted it's a guilty pleasure yes no i definitely would agree with that i mean it's one of those things where it's like tv prank shows I hate those as well. They should be on the list at some point. But, you know, you're laughing. You see someone, you know, get tricked or scared and you kind of, you laugh, but you don't think you should. But it's still funny. I mean, Schadenfreude is one of those things where you can experience it and still feel guilty. Or there's times when it is like karmic and it's deserved. Like, you know, how did you feel after the general election, Alex? Yeah, Did you I, feel I, bad at feeling schadenfreude? I didn't in that case. I guess yeah. there, there are times when you think... I guess it's about the ratio of how funny you find it to how much harm has actually been done and how much the person deserves it. There's a lot of factors. Like, yes, So it, you're not always going to feel the same way. There are things that you you laugh at and feel bad immediately because it's like someone falling over and you're like, oh, they didn't really deserve to fall over, but it was still funny to see it. But um, when it's something that was so calculated and, you know, she called the election from a a sense of not being able to possibly lose it and wanting to crush all opposition, you're kind of like, well, you reap what you sow. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose I was looking at it through the lens of feeling like it was deserved. But now that you mention, I guess there are times that you feel bad about it or you... You're right, you should weigh up the harm it's doing. So, yeah, maybe it'll go lower than I expected. There is, of course, a, to... a song about it in the musical Avenue yes, Q. Yes, there which is. Which I've had running awesome. through my head since you mentioned it. Oh, sorry. It's okay. S-H-A-N-D-E. Oh, no, I can't even sing it anymore. S-C-H-A-D-E-N-F-R-E-U-D-E. There we go. Ha, you can't even sing it anymore. Ha, 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 ha. I'm trying to remember the last time, apart from this election, where I felt it, because... It is quite rare. I think as you get older, you kind of... There's certain types of it that you sort of grow out of, or you try to... You sort of make a conscious effort. I'm not going to do that anymore. Like, just (laughs) seeing someone fall over in public. When I was a child, I would just have gone, ah, ha, ha, ha. But now I probably just... Part of me would want to do that, but I'd also have this other part that was like, no, don't do that. That's not nice. You just reminded me of one. Oh, it was funny, but it was bad. I felt so bad. We had, and it happened multiple times, we had this class, and it, we were in this classroom that had, like, glass wall that looks into the corridor, and there was a glass door, and the door was always left open, but there was a time when someone came in and gave a guest sort of lecture, and then as they were leaving, the whole class was, like, watching them leave, and they walked right into a glass pane, and their hat fell off, <laughs> and it, I just felt so bad because they were a really sweet person, and that had happened, it was really embarrassing, their hat had fallen off, which was really funny, and they left, and I don't think they probably made it far enough down the corridor before everyone started laughing, and I just felt so bad, because they were grown up, and it was just so, like, childish, but it was really funny. Mm. (laughs) So yeah, okay, I feel guilty about that, okay. When you laugh out loud and they're in your presence still, I guess I feel bad. Yeah. How do you feel about seeing someone, um, I don't know, running for a bus and then the bus goes without them? That That's that's a good source of this feeling, I think. Or or watching someone, I don't know, maybe they're driving their car a bit too fast and then they get stopped at the traffic light. You know, they're, they're, I think these yeah. things happen happen every the, day in a, in a kind of small way. Yeah, I mean, the, the traffic light one, you feel that one's completely justified. Someone missing the bus, especially if it's someone who's older or isn't necessarily capable of running for long distance, and and they get like you see them really struggling and they work really hard and then they don't get it i don't feel any sense of schadenfreude at that 
But uh-huh. some people do, so I suppose there are very not nice people out there who I feel it far often than you would like. This is another sort of troubling aspect of it that I just thought of, is you kind of, you probably in that scenario, it depends on the person and what they look like. You would make some sort of snap judgment about them, like if they had a mm. swastika tattoo, then you'd be like, ha, you didn't I think get it the is, bus. I, I think if, it's possible to, 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 to use it as a kind of a cloak for meanness sometimes, I, I think is what is what we take away from, from what we just said. I mean, yeah. Hmm. I can see the upsides to it, and it does. It is one of those things where it allows you to get something good out of something bad, which yeah. is kind of nice. You know, the balance of the universe comes into it there, I suppose. Yeah, it, it all depends on context. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, what, what what did you think then? Would you would you put it high up on the list? Well, initially or? I was thinking about not high, but you know, fairly high because I hmm. was thinking about because again, it's happiness at the misfortune of others. So there is both happiness and misfortune in there. But now yeah, that we've true. talked about like people missing buses, and I'm like, yeah, actually, certain people experience Schadenfreude in a very cruel way. I suppose me laughing at someone losing an election is kind of cruel, but to to the people who support her, it's cruel, perhaps. Mm, I don't know. Yeah. I guess I guess it's more nuanced. So it's probably somewhere hit to be so boring, somewhere middle-ish. Yeah. Or maybe it's lower. I would probably. Yeah, I mean, it can be very bad, like, especially when you're on the receiving end of it. When you're on the other side, it's like, I'm sure I have been in situations where I've, like, I, I don't know, been running for a bus or fallen over. I can't think of specific examples, but I'm sure I've been in situations where people have laughed at me, like, for, for some s- small misfortune, and I've been like, oh. Like, it just adds a, a little layer of, the world is against me. It's not just that bad thing happened randomly. It's... That bad thing happened, and they were like, just by laughing, they were complicit in it somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. it's their fault, really, fundamentally. Yeah. I wonder if it yeah. should be somewhere down by like freshly squeezed lemon juice, E17, just before we get into the stuff that's completely bad stuff. Maybe. You know, because it is, it's not as good as breakfast in bed, or you know, it's not as good okay. as straws. Like, I far <laughs> rather, well, I don't know. It is when it's good, it's good, and when it's bad, it's bad. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's so variable, you kind of have to awkwardly put it in the middle, I suppose. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'd go, I'd go along with putting it somewhere around there. Do you, if you don't think it's as good as breakfast in bed, I'm happy to put it below that. Yeah. And I'm happy to recognise that most people don't like freshly squeezed lemon juice as much as I do, and you certainly I would wouldn't. I definitely don't, no. I did yeah. plan on trying some since um, since the last time I was on, but I, I haven't, so oh, I, I can't... Uh, what can I tell you about decision. freshly squeezed? Yeah, I know. Probably is, to be honest. Um, are we okay with putting it there, then? Let's between those two. Oh god, see if I can spell it first time. S-C-H-A-D-E-N-F-R-E-U-D-E. It, it looks right. Okay. That's right. Looks right to me. There's no umlauts or anything on it, is there? Nine. It's not a, that's not a it's proper nine. German word with no umlauts on it. That's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so good. That was a good start. Very good first thing to bring. Very nuanced subject. Shall we move on to Mark then? Yeah, I can do my thing. Cool. Uh, my thing is Sunday. Oh, okay. The day of Sunday. What is the point of the day of Sunday? This is my question. <laughs> it's to record podcasts. <laughs> we are, we are recording this on a Sunday, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, so, I mean, we have two days off in a week. We have a, we have a Saturday, and everybody knows what you do on a Saturday. You probably go shopping. Uh, maybe you go out to a restaurant or a bar or the theatre in the evening. These are, these are Saturday things. What, my question to you, is a Sunday thing? What do you do mm. on a Sunday? Well, if you have a car, maybe you wash it. If you have a garden, maybe you, 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 you do the garden. Maybe you do your housework. Maybe you sit and watch football. Maybe you sit in the pub all afternoon. But it seems to me there are, there are less obvious things that you do on a Sunday. I don't know what it's for. I've never understood what it's for. And in certain places, Scotland isn't too bad for this, but in certain places, the shops aren't even open mm, yeah, uh, that's so for a annoying. sensible that amount of time. That so me when I go to England. You, like, you can't even pretend it's a Saturday sometimes. You know, it's, it's just, it's one of these things that confuses me. And I like, to, I like to bring things that confuse me so that I can try and understand them better yeah, um, well, when, we, when we get them on a list. For me, a Sunday is a day for not doing all the things I didn't do on the Saturday not doing all the things you didn't yeah. do on the Saturday. So, day, so I normally have a list of things to do on the Saturday, like go to certain shops or do certain work, and then I end up inevitably not doing some of it, and then I also don't do it on the Sunday. Right. Because it's Sunday, so why would I? So it's a day for not doing hmm. things I didn't do. So it's a, it's a day for not doing anything? Yeah, basically. Day of procrastination and feeling guilty and going, oh no, I really should have done these things. But I do that on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. Well, it I suppose like I do, do well, but then do. they just... I, they do, but I just then push those things onto the Sunday's to-do list, which I know I'm not going to do because it's a Sunday's to-do list. I mean, huh. Okay. I mean, 
we probably have inherited some of the the laziness that goes with Sundays from God, because from those like, lazy he Christians, uh-huh. he basically just gave us permission to. I mean, if God is, if God can just laze around for a whole day, then it feels like you know we can as well. I, I wonder if that sort of subconsciously seeped into our minds, and we're like, Sunday is a day for doing nothing. That's, That's a great a point. Good point. Yeah, because Sunday is, you know, you're not supposed to do any work on a Sunday. Yeah, yeah I mean, some hardcore Christians. You know, there are certain things that they won't do on a Sunday. And like murder. Mm, yeah, that officially you're not supposed to murder <laughs> on a Sunday. Officially. Yeah. I had this weird experience last week as well. I woke up and there was this weird noise in my room and eventually I worked out it was an alarm going off. And I looked at my watch because it was, it was the thing making the alarm and uh, it said 7.30 on it. And I thought, why on earth have I set an alarm for 7.30 on a Sunday? What on earth am I thinking? And I even went into the settings on the watch. I'm going, why is this alarm set to be going off on a Sunday? This makes no sense. And it took me fully five minutes to realize it was going off because it was Monday. Oh, no. And oh, no. So I thought I had another Sunday. I, I don't know where that Sunday had gone, the, the original one. And uh, ah, we're, Oh, dear. My life is terrible. <laughs> Oh, no, um, maybe one day you'll you'll have two Sundays in a row to make up for it. Maybe I, I could <laughs> fly somewhere. Bank holiday is a Monday bank holiday is for doing all the things you didn't do on a Sunday that you didn't do on a Saturday. Yes, well, mm. what no, well what normally happens on those is I forget to turn off the weekday alarm and have exactly that uh, situation. But for real, I think the problem, the main problem for me with Sundays is, and they probably are my least favorite day of the week in some ways. Tuesdays aren't aren't very good either. But um, so much of life is anticipating what's going to happen next. So Friday is great because you're anticipating the weekend. Yes, and sun- Sunday is the opposite because you're anticipating the week beginning again yes so you can't really enjoy it and i say this as someone who doesn't actually have a job so it shouldn't matter but i still have some of that sort of shared cultural sort of sense of weekends are good weekdays are bad so you know on on sunday it's just like oh the week's gonna begin tomorrow and it just it ruins it it's like the boxing day of weekdays it, it is like, it is something like hey, that. i love boxing day yeah actually boxing day is pretty good but you're also aware that oh it's ages till the next christmas it's as far from next christmas as it can get no i i, I if i'm honest on boxing day it's like oh i've got a whole week before new year it's a great time that window okay that was a flawed analogy then sorry <laughs> yeah sunday i'm not not a huge fan but Again, I like if we... them just because they're part of the weekend. Exactly. So if, if we I'm... got rid of them, then we'd only have one yeah. day of weekend, which would be and worse. Then that sa- and then a Saturday would just become the new Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I can see that. It would just become the new day of, like... I, I like Sundays because it it's what makes Saturdays good. As Alex said, the anticipation thing, a Saturday is good because you know you don't have to do anything the next day. Uh, right, and Sundays are bad because they're followed by Mondays. I, yeah, I yeah. can see that. I can see that. So because you have to do nothing on a Sunday, you can stay up late on a Saturday, you can go out, you can do whatever you mm. want. I mean, I just find them really awkward because I think a lot of the things I want to do tend to be kind of in the middle of the day on a Sunday. Like if I want to watch mm. the, the Formula One or something like that, that's right in the middle of the Sunday. So so I've got, the, I've got the morning to do something else and then I can watch that and then it's nearly the end of the day. So I don't know, do I go and sit in the pub for the rest of the day? Do, what, what do I do? Do I go and wash the car? I, I, I don't know. Do you know, that brings up a good point, something that my family never did, but a Sunday roast is a big tradition in parts of England. Of course, absolutely. Like having mm. a big Sunday dinner and it's like, I kind of wish, like, because it's like a carvery every weekend, and that would be awesome. Gavin like, likes I would a carvery, love everybody. That. I love mm. a carvery. Oh, I should have brought a carvery. going to do that sometime. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I mean, that would be great. Like, I, that makes your Sunday a thing. Like, that's why you sit and watch the football or whatever in the afternoon. Yeah. And then you have your Sunday roast. I do like, like a Sunday roast. I, I hardly ever have one these days, but I do, I do like one. I did have one last week, just before my experience of waking up on Monday thinking it was Sunday. So that's very confusing, because I had had a proper traditional Sunday as well. So There mm. you go. I'm just going mad. <laughs> Oh As to where it goes on the list, I don't know. We have a year on the list. We don't have any. Do we have any months? Yeah. I don't think we have any no, months. We, we don't have we, any months. So we don't have periods of time really that I can I can use to sort of gauge where it should. Oh, we have summer holidays as a yes. concept. That, they're quite high up as well. I think they are. Or daytime and nighttime, of course. Yeah, that was that was tricky to know where to place those. Yeah, I don't know. Sunday feels like maybe uh, it's another middle thing, really, isn't it? Because it's no, I think it's higher. Do you think? I think because, you, like, summer holidays, we don't all get summer holidays. But and we get a Sunday, Sunday every week. You get a Sunday every week. I'm coming yeah. round to the idea that Sunday is basically a good thing. 
I it just, is. I just find them a bit tricky. I've never really got the hang of them, I suppose, is what you could say. But it's a full 24 hours of time that you can do... Yeah, we kind of don't do any work, but surely that's a good thing. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they are a good thing. It's just that the human brain seems to be... Or at least mine seems to be wired in a weird way, where it's always a day ahead and it's going, oh, look what you've been doing in a day. So I can't really enjoy Sundays as much as I should. But they're also... They act as a buffer yeah. and they allow you to enjoy Saturday. So in that sense, yeah, you're right. They're, they're good. Yeah, you can't, you can't blame Sunday for the fact that it's followed by Monday because really we should be talking about Monday if we're going to do that. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm thinking probably top 20 for Sunday then. Does that seem that, reasonable? That, that seems reasonable to me. Maybe. I mean, maybe. I, I guess summer holidays are better than Sundays. They're just less frequent and not everyone gets them. Yeah. Right. Well, let's let's stick it around there. Let's, let's, let's put it below summer holidays. That's my proposal. Let's stick sure. it below yeah. summer holidays. Okay. That feels yep. like a good play. There we go. Good consensus. Thanks, everybody. Yay. Thank you very much, Mark. And now that just leaves my thing for Bring a Thing, and my thing for Bring a Thing is bananas! Ooh. Ooh. I like bananas. I don't like bananas. I love oh. bananas. Ah. Mm, this could be tricky then. I don't know if I love bananas, but I like them. And I think they're a good thing. Um, and I'm sure I had more to say about them than that, but... Well, I have, I have a few concerns. I love bananas. Go on. But... I like them at a certain ripeness, and mm-hmm. it's it's very difficult because that window is very short. Especially here. Oh, I don't think I mentioned earlier, but I'm in Los Angeles, which is a very hot place. And so when I buy bananas, if I buy them slightly green, in a couple of days they're yellow, and then a day later they're brown. It's like, yeah, that can happen. I, so I can't buy too many bananas at once. I almost that have is... to buy like a banana a day so that I have a constant cycle of one that's ripe, but it just never works. And I always end up throwing out like three or four bananas a week and it drives me nuts. A... And then, and they stink when they get to that point and you throw them in your bin. So you have to actually like take the bins True. out immediately. Yeah, that is, so. that is a problem. You're right. You're right. The ripeness thing is, is tricky to get right. And they used to do a thing where they would give you some like eat me bananas and some keep me bananas. I don't know if they still do. I haven't seen it for ages, but they used to have yeah. ones, some that weren't ripe yet and some that were, but even that is sort of, doesn't no. quite work because you're still some of them are still going to be riper than others when you eat them so you, what they really need to do is give you like one for each day of the week yeah like this is your yes. monday banana tuesday banana wednesday banana but they can't just... because there'll be the one that's too green for friday will never ripen if it's too green it never gets the right level of ripeness before it goes bad i don't understand why you can't just buy a banana every day well I, it's not as convenient i don't live near a, like a supermarket and i don't often pass one especially here and then if you buy them from like a cafe or something or at work there's never the ripeness that you want okay. it's like it, it's just it's a lot of faff yeah you're right but in other ways they're amazingly convenient like oh yeah rem- remember great. that youtube video which was trying to use bananas as proof of god's existence it was like this guy like holding up a banana and going this is the atheist nightmare because, <laughs> yes. <laughs> because it fits perfectly in your hand. You can grip it really easily. It comes with its own wrapper and it has a tab at the top you can open up and um, peel off and it's biodegradable. It's just perfect. It's perfect in every way for convenience. You know, obviously ignoring the fact that it's been cultivated by humans over yeah. hundreds of years to make it like that. I believe um, um, I believe all bananas that currently exist in the world are clones of a particular banana plant from something like Lord Cavendish in the 1800s or something like that. Oh I yes, seem to remember. Cavendish. Cavendish is the big. Is the big type of banana. Name and, ma- the, and bananas. Yeah. So the, the, he's the top banana. He is the top banana. <laughs> Very good, Gavin. Nice. Very good. Yeah, but if you look at wild bananas, they're they're really weird looking. They're they're sort of squished and they have hard black seeds in them. Ugh, they, I didn't they, know they, that. Look, they look strange. But the yeah. other the other thing in, in like the the beautiful thing about that, and I'm sure someone smarter than me came up with this comparison, but it's like, ah yes, the banana, perfect, perfect fruit for ease and human consumption. And then you go, What about all the other fruits? Like what about the pineapple or the kiwi? Yeah. Or, you know, all these fruits. The pineapple is probably the craziest one. Like, how do you eat that? You have to, like, get knives and cut it and take the core out. And, yeah, I mean, that it's hard to tell when that's ripe. So the coconut, you know, all these fruits, you're like, "Uh, well, actually, the coconut's technically not a fruit. But still. Coconuts are amazing things. I I much prefer coconuts because you need to to use a drill or something to get into them. See, but the convenience of, this is the thing, the convenience of bananas and the taste, and they're really good for you, obviously. All those things are great. I just get frustrated about them not being because i'm just it's just because i'm fussy wouldn't you be better off with an orange because they have similar features you never know with oranges though 
I can never tell if an orange is ripe from looking at it. It's basically just Russian roulette when, with an orange, for me at least. It's like, I just Sometimes it's just horrible. Sometimes you open it up and it's all shriveled and, and doesn't taste of anything and it's horrible. But sometimes you open it up and it's the most delicious thing ever. Oranges are a whole whole other kettle of fish. Which, yeah. Okay, right. Yeah, we shouldn't Scratch get into, the but... orange suggestion. The other thing about bananas, though, is they bruise really easily. True. Like, you drop them. And it's it's gone. It's a goner. Also, they like infect everything around them. If they get slightly past ripe, then everything around them begins to smell of banana. And also, they make other <laughs> fruits. They make other fruits go off. It's like they they they're oh, like infectious. They well, they seem to. Maybe I'm imagining it, but uh, I think I agree with you. Like... I think I think whenever there's a banana in this house, the whole place smells a banana for a fortnight afterwards. Yeah. It's... Well, again, that's only once mm. it goes past the point of being a good, like the, the edible yeah, point. Well, that's what I mean. Ones... That's why when you throw them out, it's just like the whole place stinks a banana if you don't take your bins out. I think the ones we get are, are obviously on the point of of becoming overripe when we get them. I think that must be the problem. Mm. Yeah, there, there's definitely an issue there with with ripeness. But also, and one last thing that I wanted to say about banana. As, um, because I want to share it with the world, and we have we have used this this podcast uh, previously as a sort of place to share recipes for things. But you can make a very delicious treat with a banana if you spread honey on it and then stick Rice Krispies onto the honey. It's very I'm gonna difficult. offer an alternate. I'm gonna offer an alternate for those who, because I'm not a huge honey fan. I'm gonna say stick it in Nutella. And then oh. stick it in Cocoa Pops. I'm going to say oh, stick wow. it in the bin and eat the Cocoa Pops. <laughs> that's a good... Yes, yes, that's a good one. Okay, those are three possible recipes. I mean, the third one isn't necessarily a recipe. It's more just to sort of... But be sure uh, and take the bin out straight away. And the um, second one may reactivate Alana's Nutella addiction. So it's 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 for people who are not addicts. <laughs> yes, I guess, yes. Be, be, be responsible with what you do with your banana, please. Thank you. <laughs> Anyway, See, yeah, there's that's... another use for bananas. <laughs> Leave <What>? it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I think they're good. Um, you, you guys have like made me think they're not as good as I thought. I thought they were going to be easy, like top twenty thing, but maybe not. Maybe not. But again, I do like them, and they are good for you. There, I think there probably are better fruits in terms of. I mean, they're very divisive. They're and... very, very divisive. Like I know James doesn't like them at all, and and people who don't like them seem to really not like them. Yeah. And they are just a, They're very different from other fruits. It's like you wouldn't necessarily even put them in the same category as other fruits if you you know just found them randomly and didn't know what they were. You'd be like, what is this? It's not like anything else. I notice with um, sweets and chocolates and stuff like that, you often get kind of strawberry flavor ones, orange flavor ones, raspberry, anything you like really, pineapple apricot even but you never get banana and hey how dare you forget foam bananas oh yeah i think i did forget them foam yeah, but they're, bananas. They're, they're... they don't taste anything like banana well but, good for them yeah. but they are brilliant you get them in te- don't you get like foam bananas and shrimps in <laughs> yeah. Tesco? yeah is you do like... <laughs> banana and shrimp is the the well-known yeah. combination or sometimes you get banana and you get like another fruit inside like bananas and oranges and the orange ones often do taste a little bit different but the bananas and shrimp, I'm pretty sure both taste the exact same, just one's yellow, one's pink. Probably. Anyway, I don't know what my point is there. I think even people who make sweets don't like bananas. I think that's what, I th- and, I think and that's banana, what I'm saying. The banana sweets that you do get don't taste like banana. And yeah. there was there is a sort of possible urban legend, um, possible slightly true thing that goes around that says that banana sweets taste like that because that's what bananas used to taste like. Um, well, um, there you there, go. That's bollocks. There, is, there are arguments. There are arguments online about whether that is the case or not. I don't think I believe it really. <laughs> Fake news. Fake news. Yeah. In the same way that pear yeah. drops don't taste like pears. Sad. They're just. It's just a flavor that's nice. It's weird. Yeah. Like they should. They should come up with just another word. Like just a, invent a new word. Like pathful. Well, I mean, pear drops are like or something. Pear, pear drops are. If I remember this rightly, I remember from science class, like chemistry. There was one of the... When they break down... Oh, God, I can't remember anything from science. It's terrible. When they break down oil, crude oil, into all the different component parts, one of them is the thing that they use to flavor pear drops. And if you smell it, it just (laughs) smells of pear drops. It's literally something that comes from oil. Yeah, it's a fairly short um, esters, they're called, I think. So you'll you'll have done this in in chemistry when you were doing hydrocarbon chains of of things with oxygen and hydrogen on the end and stuff like that, yeah. So it's like, I don't think they would want to call it, like, (laughs) crude oil drops. (laughs) Yeah, but they could could just come up with a... 
they don't have to use the name of a food that exists because then you're just going to be comparing it to and it's like we've come we've we've got this sort of weird cognitive dissonance where we're like everyone accepts that banana flavored things or pear flavored things don't actually taste like that thing but you're like that's what you expect it to taste like because you're so used to it yeah and that means that no one can ever make something that actually tastes like banana or pear because people would be like this isn't what banana flavor things are supposed to taste like and you'd be like but it's actually banana flavor it actually tastes oh. like banana i'd be like that's not what i want from a banana flavor thing ah there's one it's, exception it's a nightmare we've created it's a good point you make alex the exception is milkshakes because you sometimes get genuinely banana flavored oh, milkshakes oh, yeah. Yeah. sometimes okay. you get artificially flavored banana milkshake i will have both please okay. Uh, I accept that there are milkshakes with banana in them. and They are not that bad. There we go. Right. We're going to have to place banana soon. Oh, I don't know. I, I was, yeah, as I said, I thought it was going to be a slam dunk for bananas, but there's I mean, so many bad. downsides that you pointed out. They have a few downsides, but they're still good things. I ke- I'm keeping quiet because I don't think they are good things. But okay, okay. I think I'm outvoted. Yeah, because I would have put them in the top 20 probably, but w- where would you have put them, Gavin? Um, um, let me have try a and come up with a compromise. I'd probably put them near the top 20, maybe somewhere... They're better than the colour blue. So, like, top mm. 30. Somewhere in the top 30 for me. I'm, ju- I'm just trying to I'm trying to knock them down a little bit just to acknowledge that they're not for everyone. I, I'm not sure they should be above the Monster Raving Looney Party. <laughs> wow. I think, I think they use bananas as props quite a lot. Um, I think they wouldn't be where they are today without... Well, where are they today? Uh, without the <laughs> banana. They're about to form a coalition. Are they? Right. <laughs> Oh, hold on, With that's Lord the other monster. That's, that's the, the other ones, monster yeah. raving loony party, the DUP. Oh, okay, right. Oh, uh, burn. Yeah, I, I, I can't go along with them being below the monster raving loony party. I, I, they have to be higher yeah. than that. They have to be. I mean, I feel like they're in the porridge area because, like, porridge is good for you as well, and it's a versatile food. Above blue. Maybe, maybe a, above blue. That's what I think. Oh God, this is this is hard. We've got quite a lot of diverse oh. opinions here. Are they similar to cocktails? There are banana cocktails, surely. I mean, you could get a banana milkshake and put vodka in it. That would do it. They call that uh, yellow Russian. <laughs> I know what I'm having when we're finished here. <laughs> Anything but that. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there is no uh, banana in the house. Uh, there is, probably is some vodka, and I can't reach the fridge from here, otherwise I would uh, have one now. Uh, you know, I would put it way higher than blue, Gavin, but I don't think... Yeah. I, all I'm saying is above blue. Oh but dear. I think we have to acknowledge Mark and other people's disdain for bananas and put them uh, somewhere around blue, maybe above, maybe below. I don't know. We we don't seem to be able to come to an agreement. So that's gonna that's gonna make bananas quite a lot better than Nutella, Cocoa Pops, oh, Coca this is Cola, true. all of this all of these true. things that actually taste nice. Maybe the problem is the color blue is too high. Maybe that's my problem. Well, all those other what things are too low. What is your problem with but... the color blue? Well, nothing particularly. Just I'd rather have bananas. Okay, maybe but... we can deal with the okay. color blue separately and put bananas lower then. I concede that I prefer Nutella to bananas. But that being said, there are other ethical issues with Nutella. Whereas, well, I suppose there must be ethical issues with banana farming. The ones that aren't farmed there, ethically, There might perhaps. be. Definitely. Yeah, there probably are. When you start digging into anything, it's just a minefield of ethical dilemmas. Oh my god, this is the hardest thing we've ever had to place. <laughs> it's it's, it's it. banana. Almost impossible. Oh god. Can we put them... Because I feel <laughs> like we should acknowledge many... that they're healthy. Yeah, they have better... That's the thing. They're not as bad for you as Coca-Cola, Nutella, Cocoa Pops. They have to go higher because they're a fruit and they're good for you. I, I think I'm going to say... Let's let's go somewhere up near porridge then. It's a little bit lower than blue, but like I often have them in my porridge. Okay, so some, somewhere in the thirties, I, I can I can get on board with that. I could put them below porridge because there's so much more divisive than porridge is, which makes them better okay. than cocktails. Um, all right, under protest, but all right. Okay, yeah, we're not going to get a complete consensus on this, obviously. It's going to be one that's bumped up and down a lot, I'm, ge- I'm yeah. guessing. Anyway, and that, yes. that also makes them better than the Loch Ness Monster, of course. I know people like to know where the, where the Loch Ness Monster is <laughs> in relation to, to everything. Yes, uh, it's always good to keep your eye on that. Okay, so that was our first three things. We we'll now move on to a very quick section called Cram Session. Ooh. Whee! In Cram Session today, we are learning about something in the space of five minutes and then placing it on the list. Um, Today's thing is something that I don't know very much about and I don't know how familiar Gavin and Mark are with it, but it is the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Okay. Yep, nothing. I know nothing. Okay, good. So that's a good starting point. So we have five minutes to research that and then we will come back and place it on the list. 
Everyone get ready and... See you in five. Go! Okay, that was a short five minutes. So did anyone actually learn anything? Because I, I feel like I just looked at some words and they didn't go into my head at all. Well, I, I learned some very important things that I didn't know about it. For instance, the, my first thought was, well, I wonder what it looked like. So I tried to look up pictures and none of them were actual pictures of anything. They were all like, you know, mostly illustrations or, you know, people remaking them in Minecraft, which led me down the path of discovering that they maybe didn't even exist. Yeah, that was a, that was an interesting fact. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the only one that may not have existed. Yes, and that immediately puts it in a possibly in the same sort of league as the Loch Ness Monster in terms of things that may not exist. But I don't know if it's as, as good as the Loch Ness Monster. I don't think it's as beloved. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty. If, if the artists, like, even if, even if it did exist, the artist renderings of it are pretty much just made up, I'm guessing. I mean, there are some yeah. descriptions of it from, from people who may have been also making it up. Yeah, there, there seem to be some people writing about it quite a long time afterwards. Nobody writing about them at the time necessarily yeah. the other fact that if they did exist they probably weren't in babylon is uh, the other yeah. the other point yeah maybe 350 miles away in nineveh which is the only place they've found any archaeological evidence it says here yeah i'm just looking up the guy who supposedly ordered them built oh, so yes. one one theory being that he did it for his wife yeah hmm. well i mean it, it seems unlikely to me that they existed if there's this much lacking evidence even in the writing it seems like a group of people who all knew each other were writing about them but there was some argument that it was a poetic thing that maybe we are getting uh, fictional poetic texts mixed up with factual stuff oh right i thought you i thought you meant like it's a poetic thing as in the wonder is the idea of them the real hanging gardens are within ourselves goodness me <laughs> well maybe that was the intention it's all very profound. But yeah, it does it does cast doubt on whether this deserves a, a high spot. So like in terms of wonders of the world, I mean we haven't we haven't put any other wonders of the world on the list yet, but the fact that it may not have existed, like, bumps it right down. True, that sub -list. but it's important to note that this is the seven wonders of the ancient world, because yes. there are mm. there are many, many different lists of wonders of the yes. world. Yeah. There are people who think. go around writing lists of things, it's ridiculous. I don't understand yeah. why they do this. I know. Sad. So if if they did exist, they seem to have. Uh, they would have needed some really clever engineering with water pumps and things and Archimedes screws and stuff like that. And that's all very impressive and and clever if you're interested in that kind of thing. Because they'd have needed a lot of water. Yeah, I read somewhere it was like eight thousand gallons of water yeah. every day to keep the plants in, in watered. That there somewhere was that, much. that it basically doesn't rain very often. So they'd have needed to divert a river, which they may have done. They were very clever, the ancients. Oh yeah, yeah. they could have, but they could also have just gone. You know what would be easier is if we just like got a few people to write a description yeah. of this and make it sound really cool, but don't actually bother building it because they won't know the yeah, future we'll, historians. We'll pretend we have a hanging garden because nobody even knows what a hanging garden is anyway. It's... I know I don't really know why it's called the hanging garden. So either. the word hanging from whatever language it was in, I don't remember that bit, but the word hanging actually means overhanging. The yeah. word they used should mean overhanging. So it's like plants overhanging the different layers. So it was like of terraces you know, levels. It was like yeah. tiers. Yeah, exactly. So the plants overhang, so it was like a big thing covered in three plants. They just went on the, the ground, ledges. basically, is, is, okay. what, is what's being said. Okay. Well, it's pretty cool if it existed, but it's like the sort of place you sh you want to be able to go and wander around it. Like, if it's like the botanics at Glasgow yeah. or something, you can wander around <laughs> that and enjoy it. And, you know, it's a nice place to go. It's not, like, astounding or anything. You wouldn't call it a wonder of the world. It's probably on one it, list. It, it, it might be one of the seven wonders of Glasgow. So. I don't know if there is such a list. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should make one. We can do a special <laughs> episode on... Them. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun, yeah. That's a good idea. But the thing is, even if it was no longer gardens, but there was at least like the the site where they knew it was, it'd be a really cool like place, to, like a tourist site, to go and see where the hanging gardens were. But even that isn't possible because they don't even know if it existed. I know that it's it's so tenuous. I don't think we can put it higher than the Loch Ness monster because the Loch Ness monster. No, definitely monster... not. No, no, yeah, no, much cause... lower. I mean, it's not a bad thing by any means. It just maybe didn't exist at all. Whereas Nessie, kind of the fun is that she doesn't exist and everyone's playing along Watch with that. Watch your and, mouth you know. out. Okay, I'm sorry. I mean, you don't get to pretend that the Hanging Gardens still exist. You don't get... I mean, maybe people do go looking for them, but... Maybe, no, maybe people Atlantis. turn up in Baghdad and say, where, where, were, the, yeah. where were the Hanging Gardens? And, and people say, well, they just 
this way, three stops on the tube, you know. Like the pyramids, apparently the, the, the pyramids are like literally on the edge of Cairo. I've, I've never been, but if you drive through the suburbs of Cairo, suddenly they stop and the pyramids are there. So you can kind of get a bus and it's, uh, it's all very wow. strange. But Yeah, the pyramids will be higher, I think. I mean, some of them are still there and they're cool. But yeah, Hind Gardens, what's your inkling for the area they should be in? Well, I think we take our cue from the Loch Ness Monster, don't we? Which is uh, down away, sort of late 30s there. And they're not as good as that, you know. They're not as good. Yeah. There's not so much of a tourist culture being built around them. I mean, Although for me, that's, they're far yeah, lower, if I'm honest. Yeah. If we don't even know if they existed, they're just a bit of lore. They're not really that big a deal in terms of lore or history. To me, they're not even better than East 17. Wow. Okay. Wow. I think, I think it's quite Whoa. sad we found this out, actually, because I think I had a higher opinion of them before we did this research, because now, oh, now we've realised they may not have existed. If it hasn't happened yet, someone needs to do a Doctor Who episode where they did exist, but then right. by the end of the episode, they don't. Oh, oh. That's yeah. A classic yeah. Doctor Who plot there. It does sound familiar. <laughs> it's They're sort of similar to Alpha Centauri for me. I mean, that does exist, but it's so far away that we're never going to go there in the same way yeah. that we're never going to go to the Hanging Gardens. Yes. But it has the advantage of existing, and we can observe it at least, whereas Hanging Gardens, we only have, like, scattered accounts. So I'd probably put it below Alpha Centauri. Yeah, I agree. Okay. I don't know where exactly, though. I mean, cheese rolling is a fun event. Yeah, and par- party balloons are terrible, as, <laughs> as we have discussed before. No, party balloons are good. No, they're not. Could it go above party balloons? Because Mark is so anti I, I, I think everything should go above party balloons. I've told you this before. I mean, it's still less useful to me than video conferencing or gift wrapping or straws, but fine. Okay, yeah. I get a lot now. more joy out of E17, to be honest. Okay. Mm, don't we all? Okay, so, so we're going between yeah. cheese rolling and party balloons. Okay, now we move on to the thing about that. Today, and the thing about that, we're talking about films. We haven't actually talked about films before, I don't think. I don't think we have any on the list at all. Yes, it seems like a big oversight, and I don't know much about films, but but you guys know a fair bit about films, I think, so... I'd like to think so. <laughs> Who's gonna... Maybe I'll start us off, because I went yeah, last, last time. I am bringing the 1993 classic Jurassic Park. Oh, very good, yeah. Good job. I, I watched it last night, in fact. Um, not for the first time. I've watched it many times in my life. Maybe the film that I've watched most in my life, actually. It'd be that or Lord of the Rings, probably. So, yeah, it was the first film that I saw in the cinema, I, I believe. Wow. Yeah, it, I was a late cinema goer. No, like, I was no not so much that. More, it's a scary one to see in a cinema. Yeah, it, it, I remember it being quite scared by some of it, the T-Rex attack um, in it particular. Is, yeah, it's pretty intense, isn't it? But it was also, I, I think anyone who grew up in the VHS era probably had a, f- like a few VHSs that they just watched over and over yeah. again. Yeah. Um, and one of my main ones was Jurassic Park. So I know it very, very well. But I think that to some extent I've taken it for granted over the course of my life. And it is actually a very good film, in my opinion, just in terms of building up suspense and building a world. And it does have some sort of poignant themes to it about ambition and hubris and, and not respecting nature and stuff like that. And it's, it's, it's good. I like it. Also got a lot of good action sequences and very good special effects for the time. Some of the um, dinosaurs look a bit CG now, but... But at the time, they were revolutionary. Yeah, and compared to other films of that era, the effects hold up pretty well, generally. It's worth it's worth noting, uh, in the end credits, there's someone who's credited as the dinosaur consultant, hmm. and people often laugh at what that means. But actually, he was an animator who was originally hired to do stop-motion dinosaurs for the movie. And... They saw them and they just looked a bit too fake. They just looked a bit too like the classic King Kong era. Mm. So they decided to go through computer animation. But the computer animators hadn't quite figured out the physics of dinosaurs. And this guy was really good at it. So he actually made a few like claymation things of dinosaurs walking so the digital animators could replicate it and he so basically he was a he ended up being the consultant for the dinosaurs movement hence dinosaur mm. consultant wow yeah so it was a, it was a collaboration between some very talented people obviously yeah and to me like it made me think about why 
I don't like a lot of action films, or like some of them get kind of boring. I think it might be because the action sequences in Jurassic Park are just very short and snappy and like <laughs> snappy <laughs> a lot happens in them in a short space of time like there's action sequences in it which are kind of iconic which only last like 30 seconds or something the one where um the jeep is being chased by the t-rex is like 40 seconds long or something but it feels yeah. like when i remember it it feels way longer yeah. it's like it is exciting and the bit where some of them are running um, through this field with lots of these gallimimuses, sort of bird-like dinosaurs um, flocking around them, that's like 15 seconds long, but it's yeah. iconic. So yeah, I, I just feel like they cram a lot into the film and there's not like 20 minute long action sequences that just go on interminably and nothing much happens, which is nice. Yeah. Another great thing about it is the, the musical score is, is amazing as well. And certainly mm. adds oh, to, the, to the atmosphere all the way through it. Yes. I mean, it's really one of my favourite films. It's just really good. And partly to complement what you said about it having quite short action sequences, which may have just been a, a part of a compromise about how much it would cost to do the effects back then. Mm -hmm. But mm. even then, it complements it with, you know, it's got character stuff. It's actually got, you know, yeah. characters fighting over the morality of this debating really important themes it's not just like everyone's running from dinosaurs the whole way through the movie as happens in most of the sequels there's actually you know moral discussion and character dilemmas in there which is great yeah excellent film very good film um i don't know where we should put it though because it's like how do you measure a film against other stuff in the world well, that's the I whole mean, flaw got, in this entire got, concept for a podcast. You've got a really. book. You've got num you know, 1984 mm, is sitting at 11. True. So, you know, to me, it's probably... I, I mean, it was hugely influential, not necessarily in the same cultural way. As, well, in a different cultural way than 1984, but to me, it's up there, to be honest. I can see that. Yeah, I, do I, really I, like I think it around about 10, 15 kind of area is, uh, is good for it. I might put it below drums, above Michelangelo's David, just because drums are important. But I guess we're not really measuring importance, though. That's not the only criteria. I'm putting it based on the value to me. I think mm, that's the only that's thing you enough, can do, yeah. really. So I'd put it higher. But I think I may be reading too much into it and going, like, what's the wider cultural value? Okay, just to, just to play devil's advocate, there are a few downsides to what I'm going to call the Jurassic Park effect. Spielberg basically, through Jurassic Park, E.T. and Jaws, founded, most specifically Jaws, founded the summer blockbuster which is now all that studios make. Right. So yeah, it was I mean, part of true. a... But it got the ball rolling, but it is by no means responsible for it, if you see what I yeah. mean. Because he made a good film. <laughs> like, if, if, if everyone just did what he did, they would have made good films, but instead they tried to copy what he did and failed and just ended up where we are now. True. And also, in my opinion, none of the sequels are as good as the original. And that's kind Definitely. of the consensus as well. But that's not really the original's fault, necessarily. No. no. You can't blame Sunday for Monday. That's yeah, true. true. And the Jurassic Park ride That's at true. Universal Studios is very good. Oh, it is. Maybe you could put it higher. Maybe above 1984, but I don't know. I mean, it's better than a compass, but that's something else. That's a whole other issue. Well, you get the chance to change that soon. Okay, yeah. Put it above 1984, below Switzerland, because I still feel guilty about Switzerland. <sighs> Jurassic Park. Yay! Okay. Who should go next? I would like to bring John Landis's 1980 film, The Blues Brothers. Oh, Whoa. wow. Very topical. Why? Is it? <laughs> well, funnily enough, there was... Well, maybe it's not topical to people who don't know this then, but uh, I would listen to a John Landis interview on Graham Norton yesterday, and there was some sort of Blues Brothers screening going on. He's traveling the country, screening the movie and doing Q&As after it. Oh, cool. So there was one last night, there was one tonight hmm. uh, in London, I believe. But yeah, anyway, I think they're celebrating an anniversary, perhaps. Uh, yeah, it could be. Anyway, yes. Blues Brothers is uh, a very good movie, again with a very good soundtrack and a spectacular cast of uh, anyone who's anyone in, in blues and uh, obviously John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, um, who were the big stars on what well, came out of Saturday Night Live, didn't it? I think I think they did the characters on there first. It's an excellent movie. It does have, I think it has some problems with its timeline in that they claim things happen over a particular period of time, which is entirely impossible, but I think I'm not supposed to, I'm not supposed to worry about things like that. And I'm just supposed to enjoy the music and enjoy mm. what goes on. And obviously uh, the very great Carrie Fisher is in it, which is, uh, uh, which is awesome. excellent as well as uh, John Candy and other people we like. So, yeah, Blues Brothers. Knock me down. Blues Brothers is great. Mm, okay. I haven't seen it. Oh, so no. I have trouble I, having an opinion. I but. have seen it, but I saw it so long ago when I was so young that I don't really even remember it. But what I do remember 
funny after you mentioned the Universal Studios Jurassic Park ride was they used to do a sort of live show of bits of the music at Universal they did, Studios. Yes. And I they remember did. really enjoying that. They used to have two actors would drive around the Universal in the Bluesmobile, the, the car from the film, and they would get out and do a, do a show a couple of times a day, I think. Well, if you haven't seen the movie, then we're going to have problems here. I know, sorry. I should probably just not contribute to the discussion because when I should have been watching Blues Brothers and other classic films, I was just watching Jurassic Park over and over again and then Lord of the Rings over and over again. <laughs> so my film knowledge is pretty shaky. We should have agreed in advance on films we'd all seen. Mm, perhaps. Well, for me, I'd say, like, based on the interview with John Landis, who is, you know, an incredible director and very well respected, and based on the fact that they're celebrating the movie this many years after it was... When was it? Was it the 80s? It's 19. 19- Oh, okay. So the fact that they're celebrating the movie, you know, 37 years, so that can't have been an anniversary. But, you know, the fact they're celebrating the movie this long after it was made, and I feel like it must be really well respected. It's a classic. So I, not able to remember it from my childhood other than thinking it was fine. I feel like knowing that it is so well respected should push it somewhere, probably towards where, where were you thinking it should go, Mark? Um, I was thinking thinking um well i i I hold it in similar esteem to where you have jurassic park to be honest oh wow um i i think i don't think it had the same cultural impact though really Uh, i don't i don't think i don't think as many people have seen it and i don't know that it had the same cultural impact okay wrong that's interesting um, I mean, it may, it may just be that it may be that it's a little bit older than Jurassic Park and I'm a little bit older than you. So I guess uh, it depends when these things come out in your life sometimes. Hmm. It's true, true. Yeah, I mean, so at the time it was made, it contained the biggest car chase ever made onto film and they destroyed the most cars making that car chase that anyone ever had <laughs> while making a film, which I think is 103 was the record. Wow. And obviously it spawned... It's about building a band, right, for Al- for Alex's benefit. Uh, <laughs> there are these these two guys who, uh, one of them's just been in prison, and his brother goes to pick him up on the day he gets out of prison, and they discover that the, the orphanage they grew up in is about to be closed because it doesn't have any money, and uh, they decide they're going to they're going to get some money to look after the orphanage, but the, the, the mother superior at the orphanage says, now, I don't want you stealing this money because that's what they're, they're sort of known for. And the two guys, the Blues Brothers, say, it's all right, we'll put on a show and we'll get you some money legitimately. So they have to go and find the, there's like 10, 12 guys in their, in their band who are all actual famous blues musicians playing themselves basically uh and they 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 go and find them and then they they put the band back together and in order to do so they have to drag one guy away from the restaurant uh he's running with his wife played by aretha franklin and they have to walk past john lee hooker in the street to to get away and they go and buy some some guitars and pianos from uh ray 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 what's his name ray charles they go and buy some uh guitars off uh, off Ray Charles and that's all cool and they drive around in this in this old police car with a giant speaker on the top later in the later in the film oh um, yeah I remember trying that. trying to get everybody to come to this gigantic uh, gig that they put on in order to raise the money and um, they annoy the local constabulary along the way, basically. So the, the, uh, as, as it's put in the film, the, the entire Illinois law enforcement community joins them in the Palace Hotel ballroom and uh, wanting, to, uh, wanting to arrest these guys. So they, they first turn up late for this gig and uh, then they, they do the gig, which seems to consist of uh, them doing approximately half a song uh, before they leave the stage and and sneak away. This is the bit I have a problem with because I don't believe the audience would have put up with that because we're already shown the audience getting quite restless. But anyway, um, then they then they sneak away and then there's this giant car chase driving supposedly o- 100 miles overnight uh, to arrive in Chicago first thing in the morning. Well, if you're doing that, you must only be doing about five miles an hour. But anyway... They arrive in Chicago first thing in the morning and there's all these beautiful shots of Chicago and then they have this huge car chase in, in Chicago with wreck all of these cars and the army turns up and all of this and eventually they, they get the money to where, it, to where it has to be and then they, then they get arrested. That's, that's, that's the point of the film, basically. So there's a nice synopsis for you. And mm. uh, along the way, they, they upset a, a country band. They upset uh, the local chapter of the Illinois Nazis, which is pretty funny. And <laughs> I hate Illinois Nazis, as Belushi's character says at one point. Yeah, um, go and watch it. Stop, stop recording this. Go and watch it. I feel like I just did. Yeah, you did. Mm. There's a sequel <laughs> called Blues Brothers wow. 2000, which a lot of people will tell you is terrible. It is not terrible. 
it's not very good, but it's not it's not terrible. <laughs> um, which features Dan Aykroyd and uh, John Goodman doing basically Belushi's part. Obviously, Belushi had been dead for quite some time uh, by then. Mm. It wasn't made in two thousand, but it almost was. Um, and it's a it's a sort of putting the band back together again. The, the 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 whole phrase of the movie is putting the band back together, which kind of has has entered the language. I think I I, I often use the phrase putting the band back together, but maybe that's mm. just me because I like the film. Um, Anyway, yes, so I, I, I think top 20 somewhere. I feel like I'm looking at the list, and I'm feeling like, to me, looking at the cultural value of some of the other things. So Jurassic Park, I, I still think about the impact Jurassic Park had on filmmakers and on sort of the culture of the movies. I feel like Blues Brothers was well-received, and it was a good comedy, and it no doubt inspired comedians and other filmmakers, but it doesn't have that level of prestige. I don't think everyone has seen it or knows it and it's not I, I feel like I mean it's still a very I think it's still very valuable but like to me looking at the list I'm like even Mario I think is more for me more of a big cultural value okay so I mean it's still top 20 but I'd maybe put it below Mario uh, alright I, I will accept that Okay. and I'll watch it and then I can use my nudges and grudges. as long as you two both promise to go and watch it and then let me know yeah. yes I will do that and then we can we can reevaluate possibly and not your grudge appropriately. Excellent. Funny enough, because of that interview with John Landis, I was like, "Oh, I do need to watch this sometime." So you've now you've now forced me to <laughs> hmm. commit to doing it, which is good. Excellent. Very good. Um, do you want to go, Gavin? Sure. So I'm bringing a movie from 2003, written by, starring, produced by, and yeah, just everything by Tommy Wiseau. I'm bringing oh 2003's oh. The Room. Wow. Okay. Now, I feel like Ewan will be annoyed at me because he introduced us all to the room, I believe. Um, but mm. we're, we're talking film, and I had to bring it because I thought... I, I considered bringing Jurassic Park or something like that, and I thought maybe I'll bring one of the best films made. But then I realized, no, I want to bring one of the worst films ever made. According to many people, it is the worst film ever made. Mm. Um, but it's so bad that it's good. And I think that's an understatement. It's so yeah. bad that it's good. Now, the funny thing is, there are worse films that are put together less well, that are less followable, just are bad. This is bad in the perfect way to be enjoyable. Yeah, I know what you mean. This could have be one of those things that breaks our list as well. I have not seen it. I'm just I'm just reading about it at the moment. So, oh, we need to go and see it. Now, it's, it, it, it has inspired... Now, it's not the only film that's so bad it's good. There's another one called Trolls 2, which is just as great but the room seems to have been the one that culturally was picked up more so there are screenings of the room and you go along and it's like a rocky horror show style screening where people throw things at the screen and there there when certain things are said people say things it's a whole culture okay. it's brilliant uh, we went to one of those screenings i know i've certainly heard you guys talking about it before yeah. and i think i've heard i've heard mark como talk about it as yes. well on film review programs as being a, an example of the of the terrible uh, genre but it's, yes it's it's brilliant and i actually recently discovered one of my friends was in a stage production of the room that tommy wow. Wiseau was in wow she got to be in a stage production of this movie with tommy Wiseau, and it's like it's this strange thing where people don't really he's a weird character in real life but people don't really know whether he knows that it's bad or whether he thinks people actually think it's good he's yeah. a very strange man but uh anyway i mean it's just if you have not seen this movie go and see it my recommendation is to go and see it at a, at a screening at a film house or somewhere it, it's just brilliantly bad <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just inexplicable in places. Like, it, it's not bad in a sort of... In a way that you can even really comprehend. Like, there's a scene in a flower shop, which is... <laughs> I, I can't even describe why it's so weird, but it's just so weird. Like, the way it flows is just... There's a lot of behaviour in it that is just like um, someone from another planet trying to work out how humans behave. Yeah. And getting it wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's very fun, though. I, I'm sitting here reading the trivia for it. Um, on IMDb because I, I find that's usually a way to, to get some information about a film and uh, there are some hilarious things here. Entire scenes were out of focus because nobody bothered to check the lens. Yeah. It says Drew Caffrey, who's credited as an executive producer and casting agent, died in 1999, three years before production began. Hmm. Um, nothing between the second sex scene and the birthday party has any actual effect on the plot. Uh, this person oh, claims. the sex I mean, scenes. Hold on, let's talk about those sex scenes. They are some of the best sex scenes ever. They are just so uncomfortably made. 
but they're trying to replicate something that's actually sexy. It's just the music choice. Oh. There's a lot of the film that doesn't have any effects on the plot. Arguably, most of the film doesn't have any effects on the plot. Like, there's probably about 15 minutes of plot in the film. I don't even remember what the out. plot is. It's stretched <laughs> out over, like, an hour and a half or something. It's a strange, strange film. Yeah. Did you enjoy? You came to one of the screenings, Alex, didn't you? Yeah, I've been to at least one, maybe two. I mean, there, there's also there was a book written by one of the guys who starred in it called *The Disaster Artist*. I haven't yes, read that's it. A very, but it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very good book. I've read it. It's actually very good in its own right. And what's crazy is that book has now been optioned, and they're making a movie of it with <laughs> James Franco and Dave Franco are in it, and it has a whole bunch of celebrity cameos because, especially in Hollywood, everyone knows this movie and loves this movie now. So it's got this weird thing where there's going to be a movie about the making of it that will get a wider release and probably seen by more people than have actually seen The Room, perhaps. Yeah, it's strange. It also says here that the character Mark is named after Matt Damon. (laughs) Apparently Tommy Wiseau misheard the actor's name despite his obsession with it. Oh, that's that's just so The Room. Yeah, I mean, I can't can't understate its brilliance. It's sort of had an effect on the way that we talk sometimes. Like, we went through a phase of, I think, saying, oh, hi, because pretty much every time... Well, not maybe not every time, but a lot of the time when someone enters a scene in it, one of the characters will say, Oh, hi, Mark, or whatever their name is. Oh, hi, Alex. <laughs> it's, just, it's one of those things that kind of have an effect on how you talk in real life. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Well, um, I need to see this film then. Um, so we've we've had a there good we exchange. Go. Yeah, there. We watch the Blues Brothers. You go and watch the Room. Now, don't get it confused yeah. with the like 2013 Oscar-winning movie Room, which I'm sure is a right. good movie. This is this is 2003's. And I think the room. maybe more more harrowing than the room, if that is possible, <laughs> from what I've heard. For very different reasons. Okay. So mm. now I. I mean, I have no idea where to put this on the list because, again, we kept, we've had a few awkward ones this yeah. time where it's like, oh, it's so bad, it's good. But I think it's there's nothing actually bad about The Room now. I'm sure making it was a horrible thing. But to me, it's just a gloriously good thing. You don't watch it for the same reasons you watch a good movie, but the actual experience of yes. watching it is a delightfully good you thing. You certainly enjoy it. I mean, on the list we have Trashy TV, which is sort of like... I mean, not in a similar vein because that's... You're not quite enjoying that in the same way, but it's... I get the room is sort of a guilty pleasure because it's like yeah. I should be enriching myself in some way rather than just laughing at this. And there's a bit of Schadenfreude in it as well, I guess. <laughs> yeah, a as way. a filmmaker, definitely you're like, oh, good. <laughs> but there's also a sense of like, wow, if a movie this bad can do so well, maybe there's some luck. Because I'm pretty sure Tommy Wiseau is doing very well from it because you know no one would have bought the rights to distribute that, so I'm pretty sure he's independently distributing it. Therefore, he's making a lot yeah, of money. Yeah, but one of the big themes, not. To this is maybe a bit off topic, but one of the big themes in the Disaster Artist book um, about the making of the room is no one knows where he got his money from because he funded the whole <laughs> film himself. And there's some like weird speculation about how the hell does he have this much money? And I can't remember what his explanation was, but it was very implausible sounding. That just adds to the mystery. Yeah, he's a very mysterious character. I was just reading there he, he bought the cameras that uh, it was filmed on because he didn't really understand how to go about renting them. Uh, as, as normally happens. Sure, why not? Filmed, Very strange. I think he also filmed the whole thing on two cameras at once. Yes, yes, mm. yes. I, I see that here too on my list of trivia. Uh, just everything about it is glorious. I admire him for actually sticking with it and getting it finished, because getting films finished is a very difficult thing, as anyone who's ever tried to make one knows. Mm-hmm. And and he seemed to have a lot of faith in his abilities and think he was sort of a, a genius. Any time that happens, it's sort of weirdly there's something nice about that there's something nice about having that much faith in yourself even if you're not actually as talented as you think you are there's a certain charm to it yeah for sure i mean for me it probably goes the the trashy tv i was a bit confused by what that exactly encapsulates i know yeah it's some people were referring to reality tv and other people were referring to you know some fairly decently scripted stuff that's just not yes. necessarily highbrow but, uh, I mean, it would go above that for me, probably, a few places. Okay. Because, again, cool. there's just nothing bad about The Room to me. Like, even though it's one of the worst movies ever made, it's in a delightful way. It, to be honest, it's probably not the worst movie ever made at all. No, are, no. But it's the most watchable 
bad movie ever made. Yeah, that exactly. Too. That's the thing. That I think that is what people mean when they say that. Like, there's yeah. plenty that are just you just turn off after like five yeah. minutes. You'd be like, I can't. This is boring. Or like, you know, it, the the worst thing that a film could be is boring. Really, exactly. And the room, the room isn't really boring. It's no. entertaining. It's much more. This thing, like, there there are movies. That, you know, Tom Tom Cruise's The Mummy just did really badly. And it's probably, I, I haven't seen it, but, you know, speculation is it could be probably worse than The Room in terms of quality. And arguably, because they spent so much money on it, I'd say it's worse than The Room. But, like, The Room mm. is just, it's so watchable. That's the important thing. Yeah. So, for me, I'd probably put it somewhere around, like, the monster raving loony party or somewhere in Whoa. that era. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I can see the argument for that, actually. It just brings so mm. much joy and there's no downside. You know, I, I, I probably drink Coke more or eat Nutella more, but... They have negatives attached to yeah, them, health-wise and, again, ethically. I'm sort of on board with that, potentially. But just below reality. Just below reality, <laughs> yes. Okay, just Seems below reality. I was, I was expecting lore, but you've sort of convinced me that it's actually a good thing. Wow, there's what nothing, have you done to me? But there's no, there's no bad... You know what I mean? Like, what, what negatives come what from mean. that movie now? All it does now is bring people joy. In a way... Movies, movies that entertain and bring people happiness are have to be viewed as a good thing. To be honest, no one, even people who were involved in the production of it now, are. it's not a bad thing for them. It used to be, and they probably were embarrassed when it started doing well, but now everyone involved in that movie is doing well or getting something out of having been involved in it. Mm. So actually, yeah, for all those true. people who had the horrible, humiliating, had to be involved in it, you know, they all now are getting something good from it. So it's a good thing. Okay, yeah, yeah, you're all right. All right, then. Yeah. Low reality above the monster raving lady party. The room. And that just means that we have to do nudges and grudges. And I'm actually actually have a new rule for that, which is to counteract the fact that the list is getting longer and nudges do less than they used to in the overall scheme of things. Now you can nudge something up to three places, or grudge it up to three places, so you can oh, move it cool. a little bit further. Still not hugely far, but certainly further than you could before. So does anyone want to make any changes to the list? Yes, I'd like to grudge party balloons by three, thank you very much. Oh no! Okay, uh... so that'll be one, two, three, that'll be below hold straws. On. Hold on, can I make a case for him not doing that? No, you yes, can you can you... do the opposite. No, no, I just <laughs> can... I just want to make an impassioned plea. Okay. Have you ever seen a balloon blown up inside a balloon, blown up inside another balloon, Mark? No. Because I can do that, and it is just delightful. It's true, I can vouch for that. Okay, but the item on the list is not a balloon inside a balloon inside a balloon. It's just. But you need balloons to do this. <sighs> you don't have to listen to this argument. It's this is a entirely individual choice. Nudges and grudges. So if you want want to grudge it down, then I don't like party balloons. You can. Okay. Okay. So it goes down below. Straws. I will. I will not rest until they are at the bottom of the list. Wow. Okay. <laughs> cool. Anything you want to do, Gavin? Yes. Now I think hmm. I think it's been noted a couple of times that I object to the placement of the compass so high on the list. There are many yes. reasons that I believe this. You know, people are talking about how useful it is and how important it's like. When do you use a compass these days? And if you just had a compass, it is of no use to you. And, you know, there's just many, many reasons. If we're regarding the fact that it used to be really important, well, then certain things on the list should be further down because they used to be not as good. Like, for instance, Berlin. So my argument is looking at it right now, it is nowhere near as valuable as it used to be and it offers me nothing. Okay. However, a greater injustice happened last week that I have to correct instead. Go on. So I am going to move Cher up three places. <laughs> okay. Well, one, two, three. So that would be above head. I was totally yes. on board with the compass thing as well. Well, next time is always next. Time. If you'd gone first there, I might have moved the compass for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what do I want to do then? Let me think about this for a minute. I almost feel okay with things the way they are. No, actually, I'm going to move... This is going to be controversial, but I'm going to move the colour blue up two places. Oh, my word. I don't understand everyone else's blue bias. It's still below grilled cheese sandwiches. Okay, it's, I'll allow it. It's above George Foreman. I'm surprised, you're, okay. I'm surprised you're allowing cats to be below smartphones. Yeah, actually, that's a bit... Oh, well, we'll get... We'll, we'll have more nudges next time. Um, that's all for episode 11. Yeah, that was good. Thank you for being on it, Gavin. For first time. Yeah. Was it, was Thank it good for you? Thank you for having you? me. Yeah. No problem, yes. Good to get your perspective, finally. You're 
full share anti-compass perspective. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's what we need. So we now have 86 things on the list, and the best thing is water, and the worst thing is Piers Morgan. And we'll see you next time when maybe that will change, and maybe it won't. It probably won't. Bye! 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 Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Everything vs. Everything. Today's panellists were Gavin Lane, Mark Minto and me, Alex Perry. Visit our website at everythingveverything.wordpress.com Subscribe to our RSS feed, review us on iTunes and all that good stuff. You can also check out my other silly podcast, Rainy Day Adventure Club, at rainydayadventureclub.wordpress.com Thanks for listening, see you next week!